What's up everybody, it's your boy Phil Porto, photographer, videographer, and educator. And today on the channel, I wanna do something just a little bit different than what I've previously done. I've gotten some inquiries via Facebook or Instagram or on the inquiry forms when I do a one-on-one -on -one mentorship with questions like, how do you get the best out of your prep time? How do you make sure that the schedule doesn't get in such disarray that you forfeit your portrait time? How do you make sure that you handle a, 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 a very difficult coordinator well? How do you make sure that your portrait time is, you know, used to the best of its ability? How do you shoot this at a reception? And all these are great, great questions. However, I feel like if I was to create a video for each one of those individually, there wouldn't really be enough content to create a interesting video. Um, and it might be a little bit of overkill. So I decided to have some of my team members capture some behind the scenes footage of me on a few different weddings so that I could walk you through some of the decisions that I make and give you the answers to why. And also show you what the outcome is from those photos. So we're gonna walk through a wedding day on how I tackle it from start to finish. And then if you have any questions or any concerns, please leave a comment and we can kind of chit chat more about it from there. I hope this is helpful. I hope that you're able to use these tips and you know these pointers to make your next wedding that much better. So for me, the wedding day does not start on the day of my contracted wedding. The wedding day starts way before. The communication that I have with the couple, uh, the relationship that I'm building, so that it can be so much easier come wedding day. Um, and so I also help create the schedule with the couple. So this really nips the whole, what if it's a poor schedule in the butt? Um, it is something that I do uh, for the last like five years just to make sure that the things that I need to do, um, I can get done. So coordinators, they are great. They really help the day go smoothly. However, they work with a bunch of different photographers, some amateur, some pro, some who need this amount of time to do this, some that need this amount of time, some that rush through, some that take their time. So when they're creating a schedule, they're not really thinking, how do you as a photographer best capture this time in the timeline. So I create the schedule with the couple in advance so that when they are speaking with their coordinator, if they have one, then they can submit the timeline that I already created so that they can fill in the gap on the things that I have not covered, which is mostly the reception. So I create the schedule with them far in advance so that I'm well aware of what I'm getting into. So the night before, I used to do this on the day of, one of my team members was like, man, it might be better to do it the day before because, you know, on the day of, they have so much going on that they're not thinking about it. And old dogs can learn new tricks. So now I do it the day before. I send out a text that I have saved in my phone for, for every bride and every groom. Um, and it lets them know all the major points of what I need for them tomorrow. So it reminds them to eat. It reminds them that if they're gonna have something to drink, not to drink too much so that it don't look sloppy in their photos. Um, it, it reminds them to set aside their details so that when I get there, I don't have to ask the bride and groom, hey, where are your details? Let's start gathering those, taking them out of their element, taking them out of what they're already doing. I do not wanna set the schedule back and, and hair and makeup can take a good amount of time. So if I'm removing the bride from what she needs to do so that she can now start to gather the details, that is not effective. So I tell them in advance, you know, this is when I'm gonna be there. This is what I need, you know, for hair and makeup, make sure that it's set up in a natural light location. Make sure that the, you know, room doesn't look like your college dorm room. We don't want Cheeto and Dorito bags all over the place. And so it sets the couple up for success and it sets me up for success so that when I get there, I'm not having to then try and track these things down or clean this room up. So it is really, really important to send that text the day before so that the couple is aware of when you are gonna be there and and what is expected of them. My second tip for a wedding day is to dress like a guest. This is how I'm gonna look on a wedding day, okay? I want to make sure that I look good for my couple, that I show up and, and represent them well. The days of those like black polos with your logo in the corner or on the back are dead, or at least they should be. So if you're still wearing the black polo with your logo on it, stop, please, please, please stop. Okay, we as photographers are supposed to blend in. So people are like, oh, I wear that to blend in. 
what? It's not a funeral. You don't need to be dressed in all black. You do not blend in. You actually stick out like a sore thumb when you're wearing that kind of stuff. So when you dress like a guest, you look like a guest. And so you're able to blend in a lot better and kind of just take the photos that you need without being completely um, an eyesore. So if I accidentally am in a shot of the videographer, it doesn't look as bad as when I'm wearing all black with my logo on it. That is going to draw attention away from, you know, the actual day. So dress like a guest. Also, you dress like the help, you're gonna get treated like the help. A lot of the vendors, you know, that you are going to work with that day will treat you differently based off of if you look like a guest or if you look like someone in the service industry. It's just the way it is, truth be told. So as you'll see here, I arrive to the venue. That's the first step, obviously. But I don't just arrive to the venue. I arrive to the venue an hour early to kind of look around and scout and see what things are starting to look like. This could look cool. Maybe even this part right here so the trees aren't in their head, but they're on the sides. That being the middle right there. So one just them at the bridal party going down the stairs. A lot of times you'll get there and you find out there, there's another wedding there and you're only allowed in certain places or you find out that there's something else going on at the hotel or the resort or whatever. So you wanna make sure you set yourself up for success and that you get there. Sometimes weather can be difficult. So I get there to kind of look at, this is what I wanna do. And based off of weather, if that can't happen, this is what I'll then do, what I'll substitute out. So I tell the team all the time, if you're contracted to start with prep at 12 o'clock, you're late at 11.05. Okay, I always try to get our team there an hour early to make sure that we are not pushing the clock and make sure that we give ourselves enough time to set ourselves up for success. Syncing your cameras with your second shooter, um, making sure that you, you know, have your memory cards formatted, making sure that you have, you know, the bag that you're gonna keep on you, that you have everything in it. So making sure that you get there early is key. And so I'll scout around and then I'll also take my establishing shots. What are my establishing shots? So a lot of times you'll look at a collection and it goes straight to bride prep or straight to groom prep. That's not how it kind of works. So um, a friend of mine, Dylan Howell, stellar, stellar, you know, wedding photographer. Um, we, we were at one of his workshops probably six years ago and he was talking about how important it is to have this establishing shot kind of like a movie. A movie doesn't just show up on a scene. What it does is it shows the scenery so that you know what that scene is. And then when it's moving to the next scene, it has, you know, an establishing shot there so that you know what you're going into. So we get some, you know, detail shots of the building that the bride's going to get ready at. So then when we do the bride photos after that, then the next photo after bride prep is you'll see the establishing shot of the building location that the groom is getting ready at so that you walk them through it and it's not a jarring experience. You kind of want to walk them through it step by step so that it feels kind of like a movie. So if a bride and groom are not getting ready at the same location, I always have a second shooter so that we're able to split up. They're able to capture what they need to capture. I'm able to capture what I need to capture. And we don't have to stress and worry about time being split. Um, that can be very, very frustrating if something goes wrong and delayed at one location and then you have to get to the next so even if you know you you don't think that your couples can afford it right now think about just putting it into your contract um that that, that that's part of the price because for me all of my packages now have a second shooter for a long time it didn't because i was like i don't need one you know but I thought about the experience that I was giving and I'm like, man, I can give them so much more of the experience if I can be fully present this whole time here and my second shooter can be fully present somewhere else. So we have our second shooters split and be able to capture each thing individually. What to look for in a second shooter. Okay, so I'm not looking for someone who can take all the coolest artsiest shots or who can compete with me on who took a better photo. I'm looking for a second shooter when I am not there and they're at prep that can take a photo the same way that I would. So we kind of walk through it. So it's people that I typically shoot with often. It's not just some random, unless it's an emergency, I don't post on Facebook looking for second shooters. Um, it's typically someone that I've worked with time and time again, or I'm starting to work with time and time again that knows my work and can kind of try and duplicate how I would tackle prep. Then for the rest of the day when we're together, it's not someone that I'm trying to get to do the same exact shot as me. 
The point of a second shooter is to have an extra pair of eyes to see things that I may not. So while I'm focusing at the necessary, they're able to look around and say, what may Phil be missing in this moment? And kind of looking around. They're also there to be a huge help. If I'm missing something or the bride is missing something, I should not be the one that's running to go get it. If there's a coordinator, that's great for her to do that, but some him or her to do that. Um, but sometimes they're not there when you need them because they're doing their own job. So having that second shooter that can also assist in those moments is key. So for me, a second shooter is someone who's reliable, someone who's going to be able to be the set of eyes that I need to see things that I'm not, and someone that's really, really willing to assist and not just be so prideful that it's all about them. So find the right second shooter. For me, a lot of times it's people that I've trained up. So if you want to make sure that you have that right second shooter, take the time, invest in them, pour into them. So I'm constantly paying attention to the weather as well. So always have a weather app that is reliable on your phone. I know a lot of them aren't. Um, AccuWeather for me has been the best one so far, but I'm always monitoring the weather so that like, if it seems like it's gonna be, you know, an issue, the, gr the bride should not be worrying about it. The groom should not be worrying about it. I should be worrying about it. I should be looking at that stuff. Um, same with the time. I don't want the couple constantly worrying about the time. The coordinator should be doing that. If they're not there, I'm gonna step in and I'm gonna try and do my best to make sure that the couple does not have to stress about time. So those are kind of the, the beginning prefaces before I really get into the day. Then I get my cameras on, okay? So all this stuff is before I even have my cameras on. So I get my cameras on, I have my whole fast money maker. I typically have a wide and a close up um, on, on each side. So. The reason I have that is I want to be able to be able to capture something that's far away, but also be able to capture something close up as soon as they happen. So shooting with two cameras for me is an essential thing and having the difference in, in, in focal length is also very, very important so that I'm able to capture everything I need no matter what. So I have both those lenses on and then I have a bag with me. Always have a bag with you. There, there's the bag that has everything that you're gonna need for the whole day, um, typically my roller, but I'm not trying to take my roller every single place that I go. So I have my quiver bag on me so that I can put all the batteries I'm gonna need, the SD cards, my speaker, um, anything important that I may need that I wouldn't want to then be like, oh, I'll be right back, I gotta go get this. That's the worst. Always look prepared. Always over prepare yourself. Make sure that you have more than what you need. If you think you're gonna need two batteries by the time you're able to get to your big bag, put four batteries in your bag. Always over prepare. So I always have that bag on me besides the you know big roller that I take. And it just makes sure that I have everything that I need. You know, an extra lens just in case something goes wrong with the others. So always just set yourself up for success. Once I have all that, I go talk to either my bride or groom before I even start shooting. I just wanna to talk to them, make sure that they feel good, make sure that they've eaten, ask them if they need anything. I'm there to serve them. So I want them to know that. I want them to feel that from the get-go. And then after I talk to the bride and find out that she's okay or the groom and that he's okay, I try to find out what parent is in the room. Okay, this is an emotional day for them too. So I wanna make sure that they know that I'm in their corner as well. I never want the bride and, and groom's parents uh, to feel like there's distance between me and them. I want them to feel comforted. I want them to feel that I'm gonna walk this through with them and that if they need something, I'm there for them. So I always build that relationship. Then I talk to the bridal party. If it's the bridesmaids or the groomsmen, like, yo, what's up? My name's Phil. This is, you know, my shooter. Uh, we're gonna be in your face all day. Like, if you need anything, let me know. Like, but I'm gonna intrude in your space. Get used to it. Like, just joke around with them. Like. It's not, you, you should not have a problem getting a bridal party to do what you need them to do. Uh, if you go in and you build that relationship. The bride and groom you've built the relationship with previously, this is only a second that you're gonna have to go in, make a good impression on the bridal party so that they feel like, all right, cool, let's have a good time with this guy. This is gonna be a fun time, not a, 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 a not a daunting task. So make sure that you give them that opportunity. So go talk to the bridal party and, and build that relationship. Detail shots. So first things first, I've noticed that there's a handful of brides and grooms who do not give a rip about detail shots. So 
I always clarify with them, like, hey, this is typically when we do detail shots, you know, in the schedule. I wanted to see if this is something that you guys want or if this is something you want me to like remove from the schedule. And I get that information from them before. If they are not a couple that really wants any detail shots, that is a waste of yours and their time. It's a waste of their money too because you're taking photos that they really don't want. So I always give them that opportunity. If they wanted detail shots, I go straight into detail shots. If you watch my last video, you'll see that one of my five essential pieces of gear is a flat lay. And the reason it's a, a central piece of gear is sometimes you'll go somewhere and the, you know, um, furniture or the decor is just not, you know, the couple's vibe or gonna photograph well. So what I do is I bring a flat lay just in case as a safety so that if it's not the style that we need, I have these flat lays as a safety to take those photos. But if there is something, that's what I want, something unique to that space. So if it's a vintage couch or if it's a cool pattern table or something like that, those are where I'm gonna do the details. Um, and then the flat lay is my safety. So I capture the details, multiple angles, and like I said in my last video, detail shots may not be the most interesting thing for me personally, but it's important to the couple, so it's important to me. So I work my butt off to make sure that the lighting is perfect, to make sure that it's epic, and make sure that each and every single piece is captured. And the great thing is, is when you tell a couple in advance that you need the details set aside, they're typically always just on a table waiting for you, and that eliminates so much time. And you can grab it, and then you don't have to guess what pieces of, you know, um, their details are important for them to photograph. So the essentials for me are gonna be the shoes, the flowers if they're there, uh, the invitation, the rings, uh, the jewelry, and, and then any important keepsakes. Give them the opportunity to put anything that's important to them. Uh, I took one a long, long time ago that they had a Taco Bell wrapper that, uh, or, or a taco um, that they wanted from Taco Bell because Taco Bell was a huge thing for them and the bride and bridesmaids were all eating Taco Bell. So the taco was in the photo with them uh, in, in their details. So make sure that you give the couple the opportunity to make those detail photos unique. So then when it comes to prep time, okay, I will move anything that disrupts my photo, <laughs> like anything. So there was one time that me and my wife were shooting together back in the day and the hotel was this cool boutique hotel, but the room was so, so small that there wasn't even enough room for the bride and her mom to zip her up because the bed was so close. And then on the other side was the bathroom. So I actually took the mattress, put it over and dragged it into the hallway of the hotel and then moved the bed frame on its side all the way up against the wall. And to some that might not be, you know, something that you're willing to do, but for me, I got to. I got to make sure that I'm looking for the couple's best interest in mind and those photos are important. So I'm gonna move anything that I need to. Also, when it comes to hair and makeup, if they didn't listen to the text and the email that I sent about being in natural light and making sure that they were close to a window, I'll ask them to move before I do the final touches. And, and, and the bride is thankful for that, that I'm willing to do that. And typically the hair and makeup artists are like, oh yeah, of course, you know, we wanna make sure you get the best light and they're willing to accommodate really, really easily. So last story was me and my wife were shooting and the light was just very, very dark and we needed as much natural light as possible. So the problem was the curtains only opened to one side of the room and that was the side that the light was coming from most that we needed. So what I did was I got on a chair and just started taking out the staples that kept it latched and, and, and unable to move. And I wound up taking the whole curtain down, moving it to a corner and my wife was like, what are you doing? Like, that, that's just a little, little too far. And then about a, you know six months later, we went to a, a workshop where Jose Villa was talking about how he shot a wedding and wanted to get this really gorgeous epic shot and the curtain was in the way and it was a hideous curtain so that he took it off completely and she looked at me and was like oh freaking a okay so it was pretty hilarious um jose via actually was doing it at a way more expensive hotel and they wound up you know billing the bride because of it but that has never happened to me but i will make sure that whatever needs to happen will happen so we typically move a lot of furniture if it's in the way um that's just what we do end goal is the best photo possible 
possible. So after we get the hair and makeup final touches in that natural gorgeous light, then what you'll see is we'll position the bride and coach mom on what we need. Um, especially if there's video, be mindful. You know, when you're like, oh, just act like you're doing it, help the videographer, you know, be their voice if they, they can't. Just be like, actually, we need you to zip it up for real since there's video, you know, or same with the makeup, like actually move a brush so that it's authentic and real. And so it also looks better in photos than one staged blush brush right here for six photos. So having them actually move it around, even if it doesn't touch the face, will add for, you know, the authenticity look in the photos. So you know, bride or groom go to get ready. We have it close to the natural light, facing the natural light direction. And then we kind of coach whoever is helping them zip up or put on their jacket. You know, for the bride, we typically just say, okay, now zip up the dress, then we'll turn you, get a close up of your hands. And your hair falls completely. So if you can kind of just put it a little bit behind your ear while you do that, so we know who you are. Yeah. Right. And do I just zip her up? Yeah, on the count of three, I'll have right. a zipper up. Right. Not towards mom, but towards your shoulder. Just chill and relaxing. Yep. And one. And on the count of three, we'll start. One, two, three. Okay. Killing it, girl. Frickin' A. That's smart. Love it. There we go. For the groom, we'll say just put your arms back like you're skiing. On the count of three, best man, dad, whoever, mom, slide up the jacket, dust them off. And one, two, and three. Perfect, keep going. Dust them off, dad, make sure he looks all right. Turn them around, slap them if you need to, depending on, you know, how great your relationship is. And a lot of times we've actually seen a full on slap and we're like, oh gosh, that's not what I meant. But it's still funny. Anyway, so we get the photos that we need. We get the best natural light possible. Okay, sometimes you're in a cave of a room. Well, you gotta deal with what you have, right? No, no, no. Like it's our job to make the photos the best. So if what you've been given is not the best, figure out what is. A lot of times we'll have to take our bride or groom outside to get their dress zipped up or their jacket put on. And I've gotten a lot of people like, well, that's not really like a natural thing. Like what groom gets ready outside? And I'm like, are you kidding me? Like a natural thing. How natural is it for a bride to get out of a shower and all of a sudden there's like a photo and video team documenting the whole part of their day. And for some reason she's wearing the same exact floral gown as like six other girls. It's not natural. Like a wedding day, you know, what happens with photo and video is typically not natural. So if you're gonna have to get that photo anyway of her getting dressed, which typically she doesn't naturally get photos of her getting dressed, then do what's best for the photo. Do what's best for the final outcome for the couple. So a lot of times you will see us take them outside if that's the best, or if there's another part in the resort or um, in, in the venue that has better natural light that isn't the room they got ready in, just move them, get the best photo possible. Then when it comes to a first look. Okay, so what we have to realize as photographers is you don't wanna coach the moment, okay? Um, but you do wanna guide them. It's a disservice to not guide the couple. We do this all the time, they don't. So saying things like, hey, when she comes up behind you and taps you on the shoulder, we want you to turn this way so that we can see your reaction. That's the way you're gonna turn, to your right, cool. so that you can see her. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> beautiful. Yeah. Awesome. That's not guiding him. We're not saying, hey, make sure to cry. You know, we, we actually, I shot a wedding in, 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 uh, in the Bronx a while ago and bride and groom had their first look in this botanical garden. It was gorgeous. And after I took the photo, I hear the videographer go, okay, can we do that from one more angle? And this time when you turn around, be a little more excited to see her. And my freaking jaw dropped. I was so confused and like shocked that someone would say that, especially because the first look reaction was beautiful and authentic in the first place. So never be that person that tries to coach them into how they should feel or what they should do. Um, just give them the guidance that they need on getting the best photo. So telling them which way to turn. Hey, make sure you're behind him, not all the way over here so you're not out of the frame. Those kind of things are very, very important when it comes to a first look. After they do the first look, 
give them a minute. Do not rush them on to the next thing. Give them a minute to actually enjoy it, to actually enjoy one another, and then you can move on to the next part of the day. And how I shoot the first look is I typically have my second shooter shooting wide. The reason I do this is that's my safety shot and typically a very easy shot to capture. So I do not want to put the pressure of the most important photos on my second shooter. Okay. I've seen so many people give the hardest tasks to their second shooter and that is not cool. So I want to make sure that the second shooter, I'm like, Hey, just shoot right here. And this is the one time I'm going to let you machine gun shoot from the whole time. I want every single part of it so that every single moment, every single uh, reaction is captured. Then I'm shooting on the groom. I'm shooting tight to make sure that if there's a tear, I capture it. So I'm nonstop just shooting the groom's reaction. And then after he finally sees her and things start happening, then I'll kind of move around, mosey around. But I'm gonna make sure that I capture that tight shot of the reaction, whether it's a groom to his bride or a bride to his, uh, a bride to her bride or a groom to his groom, I wanna make sure that I'm the one capturing that main reaction. So after the first look, we typically go into a few portraits of the bride and groom. Um, a lot of our couples choose to do a first look. Some of our couples don't and we never push it on them, um, but we do kind of educate them on the importance of a first look, especially if it's an early sunset, like, hey, me and God are tight, but I can't like, force the sun to come back up after your ceremony when it's pitch black out. Um, so I kind of give them, you know, the, the benefits of a first look, how they feel uh, like they're tackling the day together, how if they've had some emotions that they've been running through, um, you know, dealing with throughout the day, it calms them when they're able to tackle that day together. So I kind of, you know, coach my couples and a lot of them choose that. If they don't, so be it. Um, this stuff will happen later in the day, but typically it does happen. So that's why I'm kind of walking through it that way. So we'll go into a few portraits of them. Start easy. I don't know about you guys, but I'm not shooting like the top models all the time. Um, I'm not shooting people that are constantly in front of the camera or, you know, like big Instagram uh, celebs. Uh, I'm shooting people that have regular lives, regular jobs, um, and, and being in front of the camera can somewhat be awkward. So typically what I do is just start with a walking shot. Hold hands, look at each other, kind of, you know, giving them little tips and tricks on like, hey, talk to them about this. Like after this, can can you make one another laugh? Remind me how long you guys been together? Uh, uh, five years. Five years. All right. So this is going to be the pressure on you. All right. So what I want you guys to do is you're going to walk towards me uh -huh. while looking at each other. Okay. All right. Five years. You have no excuse not to know her inside and out. So by the time you guys get to me, she needs to be because you're funny or because you're really, really not, and she feels bad for you. Either way, I don't really give a crap. I get my photos, so we're good, all right? So on the count of three, start walking towards me. Here we go. And one, two, three. I'm gonna be honest with you. You know, stuff like that that's easy and simple. And if you've built a relationship with your couple, which you should have, um, by now you guys feel like buddy, buddy. So you can kind of joke around with them too and, and, and make that time lighthearted. The first set of portraits, it's huge because you want to make sure that any couples that are a little bit self-conscious about being in front of the camera, that that ice is broken. And now they feel comforted. Now they feel like they're just having a good time with a friend who has a camera. So do everything you can in those first portraits to not go straight into, all right, now I want you to look stoic and sexy and this and that and make out passionately in front of the camera. Like, calm down, you can get to that. Work up to that, take your time, let them have lighthearted, easy instructions first and then build up to that. So after we do these first few shots, then we'll capture a few cute ones um, based off of the time that we have. We typically a lot about 20 minutes with them at that point, uh, 15 to 20 minutes before we bring out the bridal party and start taking bridal party photos. So when we bring out the bridal party, what we do is we go straight into a big group photo, okay? We have one that's just lighthearted and smiling. Then we kind of get a little bit artsy for another one so that they can all look at the photo and be like, holy crap, we're a freaking hot bunch. Like we want that. So we, we capture those photos. And then after that, we split it up, all right? Typically, I'll take the bride and the bridesmaids. Um, and then our second shooter will take the groom and the groomsmen or the bride and the bridesmaids or 
you know, whatever. You, you, you get what I'm talking about. We'll split it up. And so we'll take a cute one, a few smiling ones, a few, you know, like making each other laugh ones. I never say belly laugh on the count of three. You'll never hear that crap come out of my mouth. Why? I preach authentic moments. I'm going to capture authentic moments. I never want a couple to look and be like, oh yeah, we were all laughing here, but we weren't really laughing. It was awkward. Like if you've ever talked to a bride who has been part of a wedding before and she had that kind of photographer, a lot of ours are like, oh my gosh, everything was staged, this, that, whatever. Nope, not gonna happen. Actually build a relationship with your bride so that when it comes to these you know, moments of their portraits and their bridal party portraits, you can just have fun and create authentic, real laughter, real moments. So. Typically what I'll do, something that's really, really awkward for anybody is like, okay, everybody look at the bride and smile. And I'll be like, that's awkward as crap, isn't it? Like, and they'll just start laughing authentically. You know, you just build that kind of relationship, start having fun and allow the bridal party portraits to happen. Then, just like I did with the big group, I'll take some where I'm like, all right, I want you to look like you're on the cover of Vogue. I want you to look like, you know, you, you're, you're rocking that Kim Kardashian vibe. I want you to just look stoic and sexy and beautiful. And they'll pose and, you know, I'll guide them. Um, once again, it's about guiding, okay? Not about forcing, just kind of guide them, coach them, have fun with them. Get a, a, a mixture of portraits where it's funny, beautiful, sexy. Can you post up on each other, go back to back, do whatever you gotta do to like just look as suave as you guys actually look in real life, all right? One, two, three, smile for the first one, here we go. All right, get that smile off your face, here we go. One, two, three. <laughs> well, think about it, just be about it. One of you's gonna be bad, it's gonna be great. Here we go. One, two, three, strike. One, two, three, strike. One, two, three, strike. All, all of the above, okay? And then after that, I'll take individuals with each and every person in their bridal party. Um, the bridesmaid with each one of her bride, uh, the bride with each one of her bridesmaids, the groom with each one of his groomsmen. I wanna make sure that those happen because those are important. Like those are the most important people that they've invited outside of their parents, grandparents typically. So after bridal party portraits, we go into the family photos, okay? We all love our families, but let's be real, some of the most stressful points for a bride and groom that I've noticed in years past was family photo time. Everyone's got an opinion of what photos should or shouldn't be taken. And the only opinion I really care about is the bride and groom. They're the ones who hired me. So I wanna make sure that they're happy. I don't want them debating with their parents or you know siblings or anybody that they don't wanna take this photo or why am I taking a photo with so-and-so? I haven't seen them since I was four. Like, I don't want that. So what I do is well in advance, I get a list from the couple of every single photo with every single person's name. So I'm able to just go through that list, take those photos, and then tell the family, hey, based off of timeline, we have to move on to the next portion of the day. But if you have any other photos that are important to you, please find me on the dance floor and I will make sure to capture those for you. One, keeps the couple from having to deal with the back and forth with that family member. Two, if they're mad at someone, they're mad at me, and that's fine, I will never see them again. But my couple is not stressed they're able to still move on with their day and they didn't have to argue with anyone in their family. So another part of family photos that is important, have someone there that can call out the names for you, okay? Saves time, keeps things going, makes things nice and smooth, okay? Uh, typically, if the coordinator's there and willing to help, that's great. If not, asking the bride or the groom, if they have somebody that can call out the names, that makes things so much easier and allows your second suitor allows your second shooter to be free to go capture some of the reception details. And they don't feel like they have to stay for all of the family portraits. Ceremony, the time of I do. Okay, this is super important. So I, as the first shooter, am constantly in the middle as everybody's coming down the aisle. I'm shooting everybody that's coming down. My second shooter, they're just right there capturing the groom reaction. That's it, that's all I need them to do, is capture the groom reaction. Me, I'm actually gonna go while the bride's coming down also and turn just to get that safety shot. 
I capture those safety shots at the first look. I capture the safety shots here. Always capture a safety shot because you don't want to make your second shooter so responsible for the work that you're putting your name on. So I always get that safety shot, but I'm capturing everybody coming down. And then I'm the one that moves around between capturing the bride, her reaction, her vows, stuff like that, and anything that's happening in the center. Okay. So I typically, once again, have a wide and a tight. Uh, for Fuji, I have the 90 millimeter, unless it's a small ceremony, then I have the 50 millimeter to capture all reactions. And then I typically either have my 16 to 55, you know, zoom lens. I like using that zoom for safety shots at a ceremony. Um, sometimes they announce something earlier than they were supposed to, or, you know, they jump into something or cut something out that was supposed to happen. You having that zoom is kind of a safety to still be able to get that shot. So I have the zoom for everything else. I shoot on burst mode. When they say I do, and they about to do that kiss, I just shoot on burst mode for that. And as they're walking back down as husband and wife, because there's so many emotions that happen there that I want to capture every single photo. And if I'm, you know, at a point where I'm only shooting one shot or two shots here and there during those parts of the ceremony, then I'm going to miss something. So I keep it on burst mode, high aperture, you know, high shutter speed. So everything's going to be in focus on their emotions and them being able to say, Woo, we freaking did it. Like, I want to make sure that those parts are captured and I'm not going to leave that up to chance or reliability of the camera being able to capture it in one or two photos. Sunset portraits. Okay. This is something that I push to all of my couples, every single one. And the reason I do that is because I think it's so important. I think it's so important to have sunset portraits, okay? The photos that couples are seeing a lot of hours on Instagram or on a website or on Facebook, um, those, or, or even, you know, their friends posting when we shot their wedding, those photos typically happen during golden hour. So we always push golden hour to our couples from the first meeting. So this also helps once again with creating the schedule with the bride and groom. It allows us to make sure that that 25, 30 minutes is always set aside. Okay. And it also keeps us from dealing with that difficult coordinator. If we created the schedule with them, we're not relying on their schedule. Um, we are also not relying on them trying to rob us of that time because we've already built that relationship with the couple. They think it's as important as we do. And we're able to just make sure that those things happen. So we already did, you know, the easy fun little like icebreakers before. So now we can get a little more intimate, you know, now we can coach them through the kissing and the snuggling and the, the whispering things to one another. And so we want to get a array of photos. Like we want to make sure that not every photo is the same. And so based off time, based off location, what I always tell people is you do not need 40 different spots like to take photos at. Um, if your timeline only allows two or three locations, make the best out of those two or three locations. Do not rely on the location to make a good photo. You make a good photo where you're at. There was one time I had it on our website. I don't even know if it's still there, but I was like, I could shoot, you know, in a Walmart park parking lot and still get really dope photos. And well, I got tested. One of my team members couldn't shoot a wedding anymore. Um, and you know, I wound up taking it over for them and I get to the venue and where is it? It's in a Walmart freaking parking lot. Like the, the venue is in the same plaza. And so I had to shoot at a Walmart parking lot. And I found a spot that didn't show that it was a Walmart parking lot. And the photos came out really, really great. And so making sure that you make the best of your portrait time is key. And so for us, we're going to find that perfect balance of real moments where the couple is just feeling their emotions. They're talking to each other. They're, you know, sharing memories. They're talking to us about things like we're, we're, we're building that. 
<laughs> She's not even trying either. I can't get mad at her because you didn't try at all. <laughs> and then we're also getting those fine art photos where a couple gets their photo back and they're like, holy frick, we look like we could be on the cover of a magazine. How did you do that? And I'm able to say, I didn't do it, you did. You guys are freaking hot. Like, we want that, we want that. And the only way to do that, once again, is building that relationship. Starts from day one. So that's how we get this portrait time. So you'll see, I guide them, okay? First, you need to realize that they're not models, okay? Um, they are not your puppets, they are not clay. Um, they probably don't take photos all the time. So saying things like, hey, just stand there and look hot makes no sense to them. Like coach them through, talk to them, guide them. It's not about forcing them into something, but it's about coaching them into poses that will then feel comfortable for them. Okay, you wanna find their comfort level in these poses. And so you're not gonna ever see me like be like, okay, nope, chin up this way, this way, this way. And like making sure that it's to the exact T of this perfect Instagram photo. But I will walk over and be like, hey, why don't you do this? I'll snuggle with a groom every once in a while. It happens. I'm gonna show you what you're gonna do. You're gonna come up just a little bit and you're gonna snuggle up with this hunk of burning love right here, all right? <laughs> Grab that bicep nice and tight, and mm, you know? That's it. Can't guarantee he's gonna like it as much as what I just did, but you win some, you lose some, sweetheart. You know, you have to kind of guide them through that. So, so be a guide, do not be forceful, okay? They are not your subjects, okay? They are your clients. Hopefully they become your friends. So guide them into making top-notch photos. So enjoy the portrait time. Have a blast with them. Oh, twerking it out! Oh! Get it, brother! Woo! And, and, and make the best of it. Then we get to the reception, okay? The reception. Few things to know, okay? First, be prepared, okay? I always have a mag mod on me, okay? That's what I shoot receptions with. If you shoot off-camera flash, make sure you have more than enough batteries, make sure you have enough extension cords, whatever you need to make sure that it's top-notch. You never wanna tell a couple like, hey, this didn't happen because of this. Like, that's unfortunate. When the reception starts and they're doing the intros, I'm capturing everything with my mag mod. Bouncing the light, throwing my light, getting all those photos. Same thing for the fir uh, first dances. I have a tight and a wide. I wanna see those emotions if they're there, okay? Um, some amazing first um, dances with the father, daughter, or mother, son, um, and bride and groom have happened. And I wanna make sure that I'm just not taking cool photos that showcase the location, but also photos that show that raw, authentic emotion, um, because that's gonna be really, really important. So make sure that you have a, um, a, a versatility in lens options for those parts of the reception. Then I have it in my contract, okay, that I eat at the same time as the bride and groom. Some people put that in their contract, but they never talk to the bride and groom about it. They never talk to the coordinator about it. Of course, it's not gonna happen, okay? Our contract says it. We remind our couple about it. We explain why we do it. And then we make sure that the coordinator knows it. And then the week of the wedding, we remind the coordinator that that happens. This is not because we're VIPs, okay? It's for two reasons. First, we've been there for hours upon hours. We are hungry. Let's just be real, okay? Second, we wanna make sure we don't miss anything. So we should be served at the same time as the bride and groom so that we do not miss any of those important moments. So we eat at the same time as the bride and groom. Another thing, little side tip, if you bring your own utensils, boom. A lot of times it's gonna be buffet style, buffet, buffet style, and you're able to have those utensils already. Now you're not waiting for them to find utensils and this, that, and whatever. That's a tip that I got from one of my team members that was tired of being hungry because he didn't have utensils. So yeah, I took that too. So, and now I'm giving it to you. It's a beautiful give and take situation here. While I'm eating, I'm typically transferring over some photos from my camera to my phone so that I can edit them with my Lightroom mobile preset and be able to share phone edits day of for the couple. And then what I do is I print it typically to my Instax printer and deliver them to my couple. Obviously it's not gonna look as great on an Instax printer as it does in real life, but the reaction that the couple gives when they get them, it just shows that you care 
and they feel that and they're thankful. So I love delivering, you know, like three or four Polaroids to them at the end of the night. So reception. Then when it comes to the dance floor, I'm gonna do a whole video on how I capture dance floor footage, but I am in the freaking mix. Like straight up, I am parting like I was like with my own homies. I'm, part, I'm parting like I'm with my own family. Like I'm in there, I'm singing with them, I'm dancing with them, having a good time and capturing that raw emotion, okay? Once again, I'm gonna do a video on this more extensively but stop shooting dance floor footage with a tighter lens. It looks boring, it looks mediocre. Shoot wide, get close, be intentional. Don't be so scared that you're shooting from the outskirts, okay? They want those photos of those people having a great time, and the only way to capture them having a great time is if you're having a great time and you're in there with them. So, right here. This is where they're at, this is where I'm at, boom. It's a beautiful relationship, so get used to it. Do that, okay? Then, capture all the speeches with the Magmod again. So I'm back and forth between the two. Once it becomes, you know, uh, open dance floor completely, I'm taking off my whole fast money maker, putting on my wrist strap so that I can be fully, fully engulfed in the moment. And then, special exits, okay? I do not like using flash for special exits. I don't. Okay, it, it kind of takes away from that when you're shooting flash and it's a sparkler exit. So for me, I'm shooting at a wide lens for the special exit and on my camera, instead of a flash on top, I have a video light, you know. Typically for me, it's an aperture light and I'll put a, a link in the description, but that's how I shoot my special exits is I shoot with direct light from the video light and it makes a lot better of an experience keeps that ambiance, keeps the camera focusing because it's got light, which allows it to focus better. Um, so stop using flash on special exits and invest in a video light. It's the best way to capture a sparkler exit, a smoke bomb exit, a glow stick exit, any exit. It's going to look better with a video light. Once again, like I did with the first look, I tell the couple, hey, take your time coming down. Enjoy, celebrate. Don't rush through the last few moments of your day. Enjoy it. And that's how we get the best photos out of it. So it's okay to guide your couples once again. And so before they do the exit, I say my goodbyes, okay? I am thankful for the opportunity that I had there. I want them to know that. I want to thank them for allowing me to capture it. And I want them to know that like I am still in their corner after that day. If there's no special exit and I just have a certain cutoff time, I do the same thing. Before I leave, before I move any of my gear out, I walk, I find the bride and groom, and I thank them for the opportunity, and I talk to them, hug them, say goodbye. Then, the dumping of the memory cards. You're exhausted, you're tired, you wanna go straight to sleep, I understand. However, you got paid a lot of money, and these photos are super, super important, so you're gonna back them up to OneDrive, and then clone it to another drive, okay? Best way to do that cloning for me is Carbon Copy Cloner. Works quickly, or you can just drag it, whatever. But back up those photos. Then, that night, if I still have a little bit of energy, or if it's Saturday, Sunday, whatever, by that Monday, I'm editing four or five sneak peeks and delivering them to the couple. You wanna keep them excited. You wanna keep them happy. You wanna keep them, um, looking forward to something. So I'm not trying to just dump 30 photos on them, but I'm giving them just enough that makes them go, oh my gosh, that's us. I love it, it's great. After that, I go into the editing process. But that right there sums up a day in the life of Phil Porto as a wedding photographer. So hope you enjoyed it. Hope you can take something from it. Um, and if you have any questions or any thoughts, please let me know. If you think I missed something important that you, you know, wish was answered, please leave it in the comments and I will respond very, very soon. Thank you guys so much. And until next time, God bless you.